actually. Quite surprising. Um, and this is one of those things that we need to be doing, especially in our trauma patients. You can't just go off of the clinical settings. You need to actually lay a stethoscope on their chest and listen to them, especially in the asthmatic COPDers. COPDers can puff bloods, right, and get in a spontaneous pneumothorax. So you need to be listening for that to have a high suspicion for that. So right, ask a question, evaluate how well their phonation is, how well is their coordination of the, uh, of the pharynx and larynx, and are they going to be able to protect their airway? Um, do you see bleeding, swelling, masses? Can you sub palpate for subcute air? Strider um, is going to be upper airway. That's when your upper airway becomes less than 50% 50 of the normal airway diameter. And then are you to see paradoxical movements for our little chest and trauma patients, and then listening to the chest for all the reasons. So there's a um, teaching of the lemons of the airway. Did anybody get taught this through school? It's just an acronym that people use to evaluate the airway, so it's looking externally, all those things that we just talked about. Evaluating the three, three, two. So three, first three is the mouth opening, second three is the ventral, and second one is uh, down to the uh, hyoid to the thyroid notch. So that's just helping you determine how successful you're gonna be with direct laryngoscopy on the first go. Um, and then you're looking at malampati scores, obstruction and obesity, and then neck mobility. So we'll go through each of these. So looking externally, kids aren't paying attention. Clearly these are gonna be difficult areas, right? Now the one on the top right is a little bit more subtle, but that's actually a deeper soft tissue abscess that is filling the sublingual space. Um, so you're gonna have a difficult time. So you can see a swollen tongue on the bottom one, but when you get in there, you're gonna have the same difficulty as the, as the one as those two, because you're not going to have enough space to actually get your plate and get, get visualization. The 332 rule, so again, it's predicting how successful you're going to be with direct laryngoscopy. So the first one is um, measuring the actual uh, submental space or your um, actual space that you have to displace the tongue with direct laryngoscopy. And the second one, where you're going from the hyoid to the thyroid notch. Is predicting how far down the cricoid or your uh, vocal cords are going to be. Um, and you all have had those anterior airways where they're very anterior and, and up high. They're difficult to see, right? So these people, if they have shorter than two fingers from the highway to the thyroid notch, you know that you're going to need to do some manipulation of that airway and some real prep of patient position. Then the malampati scores, this is more in someone who is awake, uh, but it is something that when you look in their mouth, you can see and help predict, okay, uh, this person is going to be difficult. I'm going to make sure you have everything lined out. And in your mind, you have two to three backup steps already lined out in your head. Um, the obstruction and obesity, looking for signs of muffled voice, so peritonsillar abscess or uh, uh, prevertebral abscesses in children. This is Children give you that muffled voice, they're difficult airways. Uh, difficulty swallowing secretions, uh, all the classic teachings with epiglottitis and spitting forward, spitting out all of their saliva. This also happens in peritonsillar abscesses and a lot of the suprabotic swelling. Strider, uh, when you have strider and you give um, opiates or benzos, you're actually taking away the airway sensing that that patient is doing. Um, and so there can be some rapid clinical deterioration in the patients that have strider in their airway just something to think about. Clearly in these patients, we need to give them some of that anyways for the induction, um, and getting their airway is more important, but it's just something to keep in the back of your mind. And the sensation of dyspnea or some red flags uh, for airway obstruction. And then clearly the obese patient presents a challenge because they have a lot of redundant tissue, and they're difficult to get position. Neck mobility, so we encounter feet spine immobilization all the time as a challenge, right? Um, other um, issues are trauma, uh, so you're unable to maneuver the neck at all. Radiation will actually give you this fixed flexion of the spine, so you're unable to extend your neck to actually get a good visualization. Rheumatoid arthritis and Down syndrome, and they have the uh, instability of C1, so you have to be careful with them. Um, and then age. Uh, as people get kyphotic, they're really difficult to position. Um, and so you have to really ramp them up and use pillows and towels and support them to get their airway in the right position. So what's your routine for preparation? I'll tell you. I mean, for, for anything? For any, so you 
you go up on a patient and you say, okay, this patient needs an airway. What are your steps? Um, I pull a cry kit out and just head it out. Uh, I load up a bougie on the ET tube. Uh, and, uh, I'm, you know, I've been doing it long enough, I can tell whether or not I'm going to have a hard time getting the tube. I usually like to do uh, manual manipulation, go in and get a look, hold the cricoid cartilage where I want it, have somebody else take over for me, and then pass the bougie and then slide the tube on. Okay, what else do you, do you do anything else in the preparation for your actual intubation? Pre-oxygenate. Okay. And, anything else? you know, if, you know, if it's a, a is it a trauma patient? Is it a medical patient? You know, different stuff comes into play. Okay. Anybody else have anything to add? A section. Have a couple different tube sizes there in case uh, I try to get the biggest one if I can, but have one a little bit smaller in case that's not going to work. Okay. Rachel, anything else you do? <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. No. Okay. So I think that covers most of the bases. This is typically what I do for an airway, it's overkill. Um, but I prefer it to be that way because I am a worst case scenario person and I want to be prepared when stuff hits the fan. My kid's here today, I'm trying to refrain from my typical potty mouth. I know, you probably have heard it, they are fireman's children. Um, so suction out and on. A lot of people will get suction out but not turn it on. And then when you need it, you need it quickly, right? And it's so frustrating when you go to take the suction tip and it's not on, and then they're fiddling with trying to get it on. So suction out and on, BV out, BVM out and hooked up to oxygen. Not just sitting in the plastic bag next to the patient, not just laying next to the patient, but hooked up and on. I typically have one adjunct, either an OPA or an NPA. I typically go for OPAs, um, but it's just all in the clinical situation. I always have the bougie out and next to me, um, not necessarily out of its wrapper, but it's always sitting next to me. Um, I usually have my preferred blade size. Uh, typically I go for max and I choose a three or four, and whichever one I'm not using, I have the other one there, and I also have one nowhere out. Um, I have multiple tube sizes, just as you were saying, so that you try to get the biggest one, but if it won't pass, you have the next one there ready to go. Um, I ha typically have an LMA sitting out, um, again, not out of the wrapper, but I have the right size for the patient sitting there. Um, if they're obese or they're difficult to pre-oxygenate, I sit their head of the bed up 20 to 30 degrees, just help pull some of that resistance off of their lung, help increase their um, ability to oxygenate, uh, help their ability, your ability to pre-oxygenate them with BVM. I also have started using nasal cannula and high flow oxygen. I've talked to a lot of people about this. Um, kind of sporadically through trainings and meetings and stations, but it's essentially apneic oxygenation. You're taking a nasal cannula, putting it in their nose, hooking it up to 15 liters, and that is on the patient the entire time from induction until you get the tube. That's helped fill their posterior oropharynx with oxygen, and it'll passively oxygenate them as you're intubating them. It's been shown uh, to really reduce the amount of desaturations that we get during intubation. You're doing that at 15 liters on a nasal cannula? You want them asleep. These are the, you're not doing this on, hey, we're just in a prep yet. You know? This may sure. Yeah, yeah. This patient doesn't care. Okay? And then designated tasks, I think, is really important to help with the chaos of an intubation. Um, it, it provokes a lot of anxiety for all the providers in the room. And if, it's, if you don't get nervous with an innovation, then I think you're being too cavalier you're taking an airway from someone or you're, att you're attempting to give them an airway, it's high risk, it can be difficult, and it and it's, is a low frequency procedure, right? So you need to be a little bit nervous, you need to be prepared, you need to be thinking, okay, worst case scenario, if this doesn't work, my next plan is this, and if that doesn't work, my next plan is this. So designated tasks, um, someone holding C-spine, um, and that's their sole job, and I'm always make sure to talk to them about how to get out of the way, right? Because you love to stand right in the middle like this, right where you need to be. So get them off to the side, get them out of your work zone. Um, who's going to be pushing meds? Do you have a patent 9B? Who's going to be holding your tube? Make sure they don't walk off. That's happened before as well, which is lovely. Um, who is going to be in charge of doing ELM or cricoid pressure? Uh, who's going to be in charge of watching O2 saturation? It doesn't have to be that there's six people there doing a task. One person can Making sure that everyone is aware of what their job is can really help your innovation go a lot smoother. Uh, 
again, patient, uh, patent ID access, patient position, so again, when we look at our ear to our sternal notch. So, so in those really big patients, you're going to need to ramp them up, starting from the shoulders up to the head to get that angle. Another one is making sure they're on the monitor. Um, and one of the most common things I see is that the BP cuff gets put on the same arm as your IV. So inevitably, the BP cuff goes off right when you're pushing your meds. And then those, that patient's not getting proper infection in So quick review of the medications. Does anybody use anything other than Accommodate for induction? Currently or in the past? Currently. I think most people reach for it. I don't think a lot of people are going for it or bed. Right. So, Tom today, remember, it's very short acting. Um, and this is the key to why I really push for when you're drawing up your induction meds, also draw up your post sedation medications. Because you have three to five minutes before your Tom today wears off. By the time you push the meds, you get your tube, you secure the tube, you confirm your tube, you're probably right about at two minutes. And then it's easy to get tangled up in all the other stuff that you're doing and forget about the post innovation station. Yeah? Do you have one way or the other that you prefer to go with Atomidate versus Merced? Or? Um, I prefer Atomidate. I think it gets better um, effects. And it, it's much more rapid acting than Versed. Um, yeah. Including the septic patient? Yes, okay. that has been debunked. Yeah. So there was concern in the septic patient that you were suppressing um, cortisol levels via the adrenal glands. That has been debunked, and they use it in sepsis all the time. So, yeah. And then, and they have found, so what they have found is that one dose will not alter that. These patients aren't getting any further accommodate. They used to use accommodate for uh, vent patients, and that's when they found that correlation, but not with the one-sided inhibition. And then paralytic stuff, you guys all know, it's a depolarizing paralytic. Um, penetrating eye trauma, you want to be careful because it can increase your intraocular pressure. Remember, any burn patients that are older burns, we're not talking about our acute burns, but any older burns, you don't want to use for the risk of hyperkalemia. Um, and malignant hyperthermia is a difficult history to get, but if someone's saying that they had problems with anesthesia in the past, you have to be concerned about malignant hypertension. Um, and then any of the myopathies, you have to be careful about because you'll get rhabdomyolysis and hyperkalemia. Questions about the drugs? Pretty straightforward, right? I'm not going to go over it all, just a quick review. So what are some possible ways to confirm? Missing in two. Missing. In total CO2 colorimetric change equal to my little chest rise. I heard lack of epigastric sounds. That means you're actually auscultating for breath sounds, right? We have a stethoscope out. Okay. And title capnography, color change. What's the bulb up in the right? Does anybody even carry that? Softgel detector. Yeah, softgel detector. Everybody use it? Good. It's in, the, it's in the kit, and it's technically in our protocols that it's an acceptable way to confirm a tube. I think it's less than ideal, but you know, you gotta have a backup. How many ways are needed? Three ways, yep. So there's the, our possible um, scenarios, improvement in clinical status, the esophageal detector, I think are a little bit less, as you can imagine, sensitive uh, or specific. So post innovation sedation, two parts to it, right? What are the two parts? <laughs> Did I spell it wrong? Probably. This was after beer at lunch. Um, and then the thing I really push is our dosing is is low in the protocols because we're concerned about those awake patients, right? That we're going to have complications with. What's the biggest complication with giving large doses of benzos and opiates together? Respiratory depression. Respiratory depression. But if you have a confirmed airway, who cares, right? I'd rather have respiratory depression if I have that intubated patient than like be feeling the ET tube or be aware of what's going on. Now that gets a little bit more complicated in our hemodynamically unstable patients. Um, but the fentanyl is going to have 
very little effect on our hemodynamics. The Merced may potentially have a little bit more, but you just have to be careful. Um, so the most two common medications I see being used for post-sedation innovation, um, or sorry, post-innovation sedation, are Versed and fentanyl. Does anyone like to use anything else? No? Anybody use any Ativan, morphine? if you need another option, but it wouldn't be my first go-to. Yeah. The reason being is Versed is more potent than Ativan. It's more rapid acting than Ativan, and it has the amnestic effect to it. So I think those are a couple advantages over the Ativan, but I think I like that it within our system, you guys have multiple options for backup. So typical dose for Versed, um, you know, five to 10 milligrams. If you have a bigger guy and they're hemodynamically stable, give them 10, give them 100 of them. I'm not concerned if you guys are going over our max dosing if it's an innovative patient. People send me an email, hey, I went over the dosing, an innovative patient, they're awake, they really started, you know, bucking the tube. I gave them a you know, 100 of fentanyl and 10 of Versed uh, twice within a 15 minute period. Fine. Again, you have that airway. Um, so I, I get more concerned with um, dosing intervals and max dosing in those patients that we don't have an airway secured. Okay. So get them down, get them comfortable, and get these medications drawn up when you're drawing up your uh, induction agents as well, because you're going to need to give these soon. As soon as you have that tube, confirmed and secured, give these medications. Don't wait. Don't wait for them to wake up or get tachycardic or start moving around because then you're chasing their tail. I think that's the biggest thing I've seen is people don't pull them up early. Right. And then your person goes up and drives and you're trying to not your patient pull a meds at the same time. Right. And then you're trying to do multiple things at once which then takes longer and delays the patient getting it. I mean, it becomes a safety issue for you guys and it becomes a safety issue for the so get these on, get these on early. What, the other thing I see is that people don't get these on early and the patient starts moving, so what do they do? They want to pull the tube. The patient wants to pull the tube, but what do, what do providers like to do? I'll tell you what I like, what I see them doing for me in charts. I like to give them, right? That's what I see on charts. So this is why when I see it, people get emails from me, okay? There are patients, they get them innovated, where they don't get the meds on or they do small dosing, the patient starts to move around, they're concerned about the tube as they should be, so they push a dose of X. Well, then you have a paralyzed patient who's not adequately sedated or have um, analgesia on board. Okay? And people say, well, I can monitor the heart rate, I can monitor criterion, I can monitor blood pressure, right? But those are all late signs. So why not be aggressive from the <coughs> beginning? If, if it were an ideal world, we wouldn't even talk about it. So VEC is, is for very specific circumstances, and it should not be the first one that you go to. The patients need large doses of sedation and analgesia to keep them down adequately. Questions on that? As you can tell, that's one of my soapbox issues. I really want to be aggressive with post-innovation sedation. We need so to do what's right for our patients. Can we get more fentanyl in there? Can you get more fentanyl? And propofol? And ketamine and ultrasound and central lines and chest tubes. They're all coming. No, but Carrie, I have had calls where I haven't had a chance to restock fentanyl and then bang, we need it again. 
Right. I mean, I have no problem with how much people are carrying on the engines. That's completely up to admin. I, I mean, because we're monitoring it through, you know, our doc, you know, the daily counts and reporting it, I have no problems with increasing the amount that are carried on both the ambulance and the engine. That's completely something we want to look at as a system. We should certainly can do it. The last thing I want is for you guys to be on a team and be short on that. We had the one issue with the innovative patient that was a transfer and there was miscommunication between the fixed wing and the crew and they ended up sitting on the tarmac and running other drugs with an innovative patient. That, I never want that to happen again, ever. Failed airway. So the actual definition is three failed attempts by a provider, right? Doesn't matter if they have a, a DSAT or any complication. Three attempts by any amount of providers is considered a failed airway. And then obviously unable to maintain O2 saturation. And that is considered less than 92%. So you want to keep your patients 92% or higher. You have a patient go to 90%, it's technically a desaturation and technically a failed airway unless you get that too. Um, so what's your next step other than, this is usually what I look like and the pucker factor goes up. Plan B. Okay. Plan B, LMA. What else? I think you try to troubleshoot first and see if right something you can do. Okay, how are you going to troubleshoot? What are you going to do? I'm not trying to pick on you, I'm just no, I, I know. your process. I mean, just look and see if, if there's a reason for it, if there's better positioning, um, was it an equipment failure, is there, is there anything you can do to help secure that airway? So you're talking about three failed attempts, right? Or the yeah. DSAT, I mean, if it's because they DSAT right away, or are you talking after we've tried three times? Either one. Because some people desat immediately, depending on their body type and whatnot. Right. So. So in those patients, do you, what do you what do you do? Anything you can, but I mean, yeah. Basically, I start looking at at the situation and try to see is there something we've missed? Is there anything we can do? Sometimes they're just going down, and and the ET tube would still be the best thing for them. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure you read the one I had a month ago that we couldn't even ventilate. With Going to the LMA, I don't think is ideal within 30 seconds without trying anything else. So you reposition, you recheck your equipment, maybe change up a couple of things within the change providers. Change provider, change equipment, change blade, change positioning, all those kinds of things. Right. You should do that every time. Any, anytime you have a failed attempt, don't right. do the same thing the next time. Right. Yeah. Should never do the same exact process two times in a row. With every attempt, you need to change something up, all of those things that we talked about. Typically, patient positioning is the number one thing that you can change to improve your outcome. Um, second would probably be um, blade size or blade type. Most people use Mac. Anybody use a Miller? That's all I use. All you use is Miller? That's how they incubated four years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I think most of people, and but it's a comfort. We most of us trained more with a Mac and have used a Mac more. Uh, but the success rates for intubation on providers who are competent in both are actually very similar. So it, it's just more of a comfort zone. And, and when you're doing a procedure like this, you want to be comfortable with it, right? Like I don't want anybody to be using equipment for the first time or equipment that they're not comfortable and competent with when they're trying to get an airway. So so you readjust, you change up multiple things, you still can't get it, you try an LMA, you can't ventilate them or oxygenate them with an LMA. What's your next step? Plan C. What's plan C? Okay, Craig? Yep. But it's easy to say when, when you're actually at that moment of, holy crap, I have to fight you now. It's really scary. Right. They, I've done one strike and I hope I never do another one. They are a bloody mess. 
things are completely chaotic by the end. Typically your support staff or your crew is a bit anxious and contributing to the overall pucker factor of the situation. And it's something that we don't do very often. How many people have done one? someone, one provider within the system to do it. That's, and that's not very often. So things that are going to make your cric difficult if they've had previous surgeries, right, because there's going to be scar tissue and alteration of the anatomy, if there's a large hematoma over the site, if they're obese just because you can't feel your landmarks, right, and you have a difficult time getting in with your equipment and it's pretty bloody. Radiation, again, it's going to distort the tissues. It may look completely normal on the outside. But on the inside, there's a lot of scar tissue and a lot of distortion of that tissue. Uh, and then tumors for the same reason. So if that bastard there, if he came in and needed a cry, I'd be a little nervous with you guys. How are, I mean, how are you going to feel landmarks on that? Right? Cut a bigger hole. Right? We're gonna, you're going to do a panis removal before. So a review of our um, landmarks, you have your thyroid cartilage. And then the ring, hard ring below it, your cricoid, you're going to the membrane uh, in between there. Remember your thyroid sits lower. Vascular structures on each side of that. That's why we're doing a vertical incision, right? You don't see less bleeding than going horizontal. Um, and then the quick takes, you guys all know, just a quick puncture. Like Ted said, don't push harder than you think. Also a surgical crank. Um, um, making sure that you don't let go of that tissue with the cricoid once you get it. Um, otherwise, you can lose the landmarks. The other thing I want to talk about was bougie assisted cranks. Um, so, you're doing the same procedure as a surgical crank, but while you, once you make that stab incision with your scalpel, you're keeping the scalpel there and you're taking your bougie and you're directing it down within that hole while the scalpel is still there then you're removing your scalpel. And you should be able to feel the same things that you do when you do an intubation. Your, your tracheal clicks and your hold up at the carina. Now remember, your, your bougie is gonna go a lot less because you're already that much further down into the airway, right? So you only have a small amount to go. So your hold up's gonna come a lot sooner. But then you can flip your ET tube over this. This is really a great way to minimize losing um, your landmarks and your, and your hole that you make um, and, and has been shown to reduce the amount of uh, tubes that get placed in the subcutaneous tissue and not actually within the airway itself. Has anybody seen this or done this or trained with this at all? Okay. So this is what we're going to be reviewing today in the CRIC station as well. And I do really encourage everyone to do this in the field. It makes it a lot easier. You can also fulcrum with the scalpel a little bit. Get a little bit more room. Velcro. Fulcrum. Fulcrum side, oh. whatever. I mean, I know you're MacGyver, but jeez. Okay. Pediatric airways. Scary. Right? I don't like them. I don't know anybody who does. Um, so, difference with kiddos is really their uh, anatomical differences. So, they have a disproportionate head, right? Their head is gigantic to their body. So, they tend to be, if you're laying them flat, in hyperflexion. Uh, of the neck, so they're not in the typical sniffing position that you like, which is why you got to do the tail roll under the shoulders. You're lifting up the torso so that you get that patient into the proper position. Uh, a lot of times you see them come in with tail rolls under the neck or too high on the shoulders and they're still in a hyperflex position. You really need to open up their shoulders to tip their head back. Um, the subglottic area is the most narrow, so the cricoid is actually the most narrow part in, the, in kids. Which is why we've traditionally used uncuffed tubes because they were concerned about that narrow area um, having a lot of friction uh, with an ET tube for long, prolonged periods of time. Um, we're now using cuff tubes for just not inflating the cuff. Um, and it can always be changed out at the hospital, but by using a cuff tube, if you don't have the exact size for that patient that is, that is needed for them, we can inflate the cuff a little bit to get a good seal to have an airway until they get to the hospital and then it can be changed out under very controlled situations. But in adults, what's the most narrow area? Vocal cord 
Of course. Yep. Um, they have court seats, buy-in support, um, which you're also helping with taking the towel under the shoulders. And their epiglottis is very floppy and large and U-shaped. So that's why the MAC doesn't work very well in the kiddos, because you can get in uh, and lift that uh, epiglottis up, but it's so big and floppy, it'll still curl over and obstruct your view. So that's where Miller has really come into um, to be an advantage in pediatric airways because you're actually going in all the way and completely lifting up that bottom. Now it's still going to be floppy, it's still going to come around it. Those millers are pretty narrow, especially once you get into those peed millers, they're tiny. Uh, but you're going to be able to completely lift it up and get a little bit more view. And their airways are more anterior, so by lifting that upper bodice up, then you're going to have a better chance of seeing that airway, which is going to be very anterior. Shorter tracheas. Um, and then using the broad low tape, it's actually pretty um, good based on the weights around the Treasure Valley for the kids. We had a large problem with this in New Mexico because there was a, a major obesity problem and we were underdosing 90% of our children. Um, so, but around here, um, we looked at the average weight of kids. There's some obviously who fall off the bell curve, but for the most part, our broad low tape is adequate for our pediatric population around the valley. And then remember, can, uh, atropine, uh, consider it less than eight years old because of the risk of bradycardia or succinylcholine. And remember, second dose of uh, succin kids, you're going to have an increased risk of um, bradycardia as well, so be aware of that. And then neocrike is indicated in kids less than 12 years old. Now we all know there's kids who are 11 who are like my size. And clearly they wouldn't need a neocrike. So take a look at that kid, look at it in the clinical situation. But t age 12 is about average when their structures get large enough to do a surgical crisis. Questions on PEDS? No? Anybody ever animated a kid? Yeah? Yeah? How old? Uh, four year old little girl. Four year old? Was it a difficult airway? Uh, she choked on a hot dog. Uh, so was there a hot dog in there when you looked? Pull that out first. Do you have any problems visualizing the cords, structures? Uh, it, was, it was a tough airway, but it wasn't, but, but I got it, so. Did you see the little one? Did you see the little pull the, the hot dog out? Mm -hmm. Good old hot dogs. Hot dogs, monkey bars, and tampons, right? Super balls. And what? Super balls. Super yeah. balls? So, talk a little bit about delayed sequence innovation. Anybody heard of this, used it, done it? No? So, anybody listen to E.M. Crit, Scott Weingart? Yes. Um, so, he is a ER doc who uh, did a fellowship in critical care medicine, so he does critical care uh, ER. And this is uh, really originated by him. It's, it's become very popular. Um, and looking at implementing it in our system, uh, we would need to implement ketamine, which is my one <laughs> little hesitation. Or a special K. No, a little special K. We have to get glow sticks too, though. Glow sticks? Yeah. And a disco ball. So essentially what it is, is procedural sedation, which you guys all know how I love procedural sedation in the pre-hospital setting, right? Uh, but your procedure is pre-oxygenation. So you're taking those patients who are awake and are not tolerating pre-oxygenation, like a CPAP or a non-rebreather or a BVM, and they are fighting you, and you look at them, and they're at 91%, and you know the minute you take away their respiratory drive, they're going to be in the 70s, right? Like, we all know those patients. You can walk in the door and you can see them, or you've been on them before, and you know it. So this is really aimed at those patients that you know are going to be difficult to pre-oxygenate or they're not tolerating the pre-oxygenation. So what you're doing is you're giving low-dose ketamine. You're not giving full induction doses of ketamine. You're giving dissociative doses of ketamine. Um, and the reason that they like to use ketamine is that it preserves your respiratory drive um, and it preserves your airway reflexes. So you're not taking away that patient's ability to protect their airway but you're dissociating them enough that they'll tolerate your pre-oxygenation, whether it's with CPAP or BVM or a non rebreather Typically, it um, works best with CPAP, and that's really what it was designed around, because they, you need to do more than what the patient is doing on their own, so non rebreather is not as ideal as a BVM 
where our CPAP, CPAP works great in these patients. Um, and then it's really aiming for an O2 stat greater than 95%, and we try to get up around 99% to 100 in these patients, because as you know, that curve of the, their um, deoxygenation, uh, once they're intubated, goes quickly once you hit that, that drop off, right? So you want to get them up as high as you can. The other part of this is the apneic oxygenation, which we talked about, which is the 15 liters uh, via the non-needle cannula. So you can put this, the 15 liters on them while they have the ketamine on board, while you have the CPAP on board. That way when you take the seat, when you do your induction, so while they're still on CPAP, then you push your automate and your suck. They go down, you have your nasal cannula already on and you're doing the apneic oxygenation with filling up the posterior artery. Do you ever see the patient actually relaxing and improving enough with CPAP that we don't intubate this patient? That has happened, yeah. Clear. That, that certainly has happened. Um, but most of the time, the patients, based on their um, presenting clinical status, will end up getting intubated eventually. It may reduce what we have to do in the pre-hospital setting, um, but that certainly is a possibility. As we all know with the CPAP in, in heart failure, right? I mean, we used to intubate all those people Questions on DSI? So, how far out do you think this is? Is this just a pipe dream or? Tomorrow, Ted, just for you. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, I think this is something that as a system we need to talk about, but I do encourage people to do this um, even without the ketamine in the system right now. So if you have a patient that you know is going to be a difficult airway or they're going to desat or they have marginal saturations to begin with and you can coax them through using the CPAP, put the CPAP on for your pre-intubation while you get all of your prep stuff. You're getting your drugs, your post-sedation drugs drawn up, get all of your equipment, you're assigning all your tasks, all those things that we talked about. You can pre-oxygenate them with CPAP if they're willing. So, Carrie, any studies on this on like the non-responsive patients? Has this been used or effective at all if they can't follow commands or understand you? It hasn't been used in that setting because it's more it was more designed around the patients that wouldn't tolerate pre-oxygenation. So obviously if they're not tolerating it, they're awake at least a bit to fight you. Um, they have not actually done any studies where it's on the unconscious, unresponsive patient. And you would always worry about putting CPAP on those patients just because they aren't able to protect their airway at that time. Uh, but you certainly. Carrie, what about using like Ativan or Versed? Versed and Ketamine now, just to uh, answer the to keep them calm to tolerate the CPAP while you're getting ready. Yeah. I think I would be. Um, lower doses. I would, yes, yeah, start in lower doses. And I, again, I would be more um, apt to use Versed. You don't see as much true respiratory depression as you do with Amazon. So something to think about, um, you know, something to look at, uh, putting it into the system and have those discussions. But certainly be aware of those patients that are going to be difficult to um, oxygenate. You know they're going to be a difficult airway. You can use your BVM, use your CPAP to pre-oxygenate them and give you the best chance possible on that airway. So rapid sequence airway. So again, this is more for the uh, patient. The, the whole goal of this is to oxygenate them once you have uh, induction agents on board. So you're giving your automate, you're giving your sucks. And immediately, as soon as um, they are down, you're putting in an LMA and you're oxygenating them um, so that you can then go in and place a definitive airway with an ET tube. So some people say, well, if you put the LMA in and you're able to oxygenate them and ventilate them, like why would you change it out? Perfectly good question. That will get changed out um, in the ER. It does not have to be done in the pre-hospital setting. Um, if it is done in the pre-hospital setting, this can get you further up on that oxygenation curve. So it gives you more time uh, to do your ET tube and do it without um, risk of deep, uh, Um, the one place that this is really helpful is GI bleeders. Because uh, you can place that LMA, you 
you can throw down the uh, NG tube, decompress all of that blood so that when you go to look in there, it doesn't all come right back up into your airway. Um, this is really where it started, um, so that they were able to do gastric decompression uh, to help improve the success rate and, and reduce the risk of aspiration.